before we turn to H10 committee, we have Nodder back. So, um, so let's find a time to to vote. Uh, anyway, and we, we do have the new um, the new amendment 538. Um, so human um, sex worker study. So anyway, we'll we'll figure it out. And Tom is on his way. He's going to be a few minutes late, but he's on his way. And it looks like Ken is here somewhere. So yeah. Okay. So um, as I usually do, just let's go around the room and see who's here. And I'm Susan Bettman from Oregon Media. Or Susan Gunsens. Excuse me, Gunsens from uh. Jeffrey Wallen from Vermont Crime Information Center. Carolyn Hansen from the Vermont Crime Information Center. Jack Spider, I'm here interning for Nana Chief. I'm Ruth, I'm interning for Barbara Richardson. Jessica Barquist, Vermont Network. Sarah Robinson, Vermont Network. Evan Hughes, Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Club. Eric Davis, Gun Owners of Vermont. Patty Conlon, the group. And Christina Rader, the Crescent Group. Give me in Federation of Vermont Sportsmen. Mike Bailey. Mike Bailey. Great. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. So, so we have a new draft, draft 4.1 of 610, which um, Eric, if you could um, walk us through not only changes, but really just from the top, a full walkthrough would be would be helpful. Sure. And um, again, in, in this draft, um, trying to respond to some of the concerns that we heard. Um, Again, starting point this conversation is still um, still continuing. We still have testimony to take, but um, but as Eric goes goes through, I think committee members will will understand what what is and isn't there. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. As uh, the chair was just indicating, we have a new draft in front of you of a proposed amendment to eight six ten and act relating to firearms and domestic violence. Uh, as uh, the chair was indicating, I took some direction from chair and from Representative Lawn to see their response to the, of the amendment uh, to incorporate some of the committee discussion and testimony that was had during the previous couple of meetings that we had talking about the substance of 610. Most of you may remember this, some of you may not recall, but just to refresh sort of how the, the document looks in front of you. You'll notice that, and can even look a little bit right here, usually what I do to try and indicate, and as you mentioned, Representative Grad, I'll certainly mention the whole bill, but it helps to know where are the changes between this draft and the previous one. And the way I indicate that is by yellow highlighting. So for example, oh, there's an easy one, non-controversial, <laughs> correcting a cross-reference. You'll see the way that's displayed is the prior language is struck through and the new language is underlined next to it and the whole thing is highlighted in yellow. And that's a way to sort of draw your eye to any changes there may between this draft and the previous one. So that's just sort of a general thing to keep in mind as we take a look at uh, the proposed amendment, page 610. So with that in mind, uh, let's go through the bill itself as trying to focus on where the changes are as well. Section 1, you probably recall, in fact, the only change to Section 1 is exactly that, just correct and an incorrect <coughs> reference. But other than that, section one is the same. That is the section that deals with background checks. And in particular, you remember that when uh, firearm sales are made by firearms dealers under federal law, there has to be a background check. It has to be uh, conducted via the National Institute of Criminal Background Check System, also known as NICS. Uh, when uh, NICS comes up with, uh, so does the, the check on the proposed purchaser, and the idea behind that is that to determine whether or not this proposed purchaser is prohibited from possessing firearms. If they're a prohibited person, maybe it's because they were convicted of a certain crime. It could be because they're a fugitive from justice. Maybe they're subject to relief from abuse order. There's a list of uh, prohibited categories that a person might fit into. And the NICS background check, if they discover that, will let the, the dealer know that the person can't possess a firearm and the transaction can't go forward. There's a provision in federal law, though, you may recall, known as the default proceed. And that means that if there is no answer received from the next background check within three days, then the transaction, transaction can still go ahead. It can still proceed. So what section one does is it takes a different approach for purposes of Vermont law and says that um, uh, you're not going to go the default proceed approach and instead proposes that uh, in order for the transaction to go ahead, there has to be a positive 
uh, response from the NIC system that says, no, this person does not fit into one of the prohibited categories, it's okay for them to possess, so the transaction can go forward. So that uh, three-day uh, default proceed process um, would not be the case for firearm sales in Vermont, whether by dealers or by uh, private persons, assuming that you don't fit into one of the, you know, remember there's some exceptions for some firearm trans transactions between private people aren't subject to the background check, like immediate family members, <laughs> law enforcement, those kind of things. But if you don't fit into one of those, then um, you have to get a positive uh, response from NICS before the transaction can go ahead. You turned it off. Oh, thanks. Put this in that big stuff. Where's that going here? Right oh, I see. Under the C in judiciary. Yeah. On the other side of it. Under the C? Oh, on this thing. Yep. On this. Yep, yep. Thanks. <laughs> well, I keep yeah. stealing it. <laughs> so, you know, you know when yeah. you okay. always drop something, you know how to disarm it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, that's that section. That, unless anyone has any questions about that, we can move on. <clears throat> so, next section of the bill has to do with relief from abuse orders. The next several sections, I should say. And you remember, these dealt with um, <clears throat> orders for relief from abuse, both temporary, uh, which are emergency orders, and final orders, which generally happen uh, up to 15, 14 days later. And there are some provisions that are were proposed to be added in the original draft, and I'll actually go over those real quickly. So there's lists of substance uh, that has, has to be in these orders when they're issued, when a person is uh, um, able to obtain a relief from abuse order from the court. Now, it starts, I always sort of thought that the should go temporary first, emergency second, in terms of the order of the statutes, but it doesn't go that way, so we'll start with the, with the final one. Um, now, these are some, some provisions that the order has to contain. Now, you remember the first time we talked about the bill, there, there were three provisions, and you see the non-underlying language here, so that's the stuff that stays the same. And this, the same three provisions are really in here, although there are some changes I'll mention in a moment. But these things uh, basically involve immediate relinquishment. That's number one. You see Roman numeral lowercase one there. Immediate relinquishment until the expiration of the order of firearms in the defendant's possession. So that has to be in the order. Uh, I should say, unless subdivision four applied. That was in the original language. We'll get to that in a second. The second piece involved um, prohibiting the defendant from residing as a residence where firearms are present. And the third was informing the defendant that they can't possess firearms. So these three things had to be in the order. And the way it was written originally, there was an exception, the subdivision four thing in line 17 that you see, that had to do with it permitted um, the defendant to be uh, testify under oath for the judge. Remember that the judge could question the defendant about whether or not they had firearms. And if that were the case and they testified under oath that they didn't, then they wouldn't require relinquishment. So, Mayor, two real concerns that came up here. One was, remember Judge Grierson mentioned, that, that could be a self-incrimination constitutional problem, that forcing someone to do that. Either they wouldn't testify or they might be put in the position of incriminating themselves. So there was some concern uh, on the uh, questioning the defendant piece for that reason. So you see what this draft does is it strikes that. So it gets rid of the, the questioning of the defendant completely. It's because that language is struck there. And then if you go down to subdivision four, which is right, there, lines 7 through 11, struck. So the proposal is, get rid of that, there's not going to be any uh, examining of the, or questioning of the defendant uh, by the judge. Adds, the proposal then adds uh, something different. Remember, the other concern about this was the mandatory nature of the, of the relinquishment, the way the language had been written back then. Other than this sort of one little out where, based on the judge questioning the defendant, other than that, it was written to be um, mandatory and, and required that relinquishment be in all the orders. So this language proposes uh, a different path that the court could take uh, if uh, it didn't feel that relinquishment was appropriate in a particular case. And that path you see is the language here. So rel relinquishment still generally required, but lines 20 uh, to line 2, pages 4 to 5, relinquishment would not be required if the court makes a written finding that by clear and convincing evidence, relinquishment is not required to protect the safety of the victim or the public. So the idea is 
there's a there's a, a, a method the court could take if the evidence were sufficient to um, to not find that relinquishment would be appropriate in a given case. Matt, can we have a review of, for, for people that don't know, like me? What clear and convincing means and sort of how the what the levels are? Yes, absolutely. And uh, right now, I actually well, was anticipating that question, so I try. Oh, I if you want to, if you if you have a better way of doing it, then go with your way. No, no, it's exactly your what you but, exactly what you're asking. But if you have a method that you're working around to it, you would oh, no, go, no. Go, go through your presentation the way you want. No, the timing is perfect. I was going to segue you segue oh. me right into it. So thank you. <laughs> so yes, the the question is uh, right on the money, which is you know with the language there. Well, the obvious um, thought that arises is well, what does clear and convincing really mean? So there's three general standards of evidence, first of proof. Uh, you know, that come up in court, and they're sort of from lowest to highest, the lowest is preponderance of the evidence, the middle tier is clear and convincing, and the highest tier is beyond a reasonable doubt. So beyond a reasonable doubt, probably very familiar to everybody, that's the standard from criminal cases. Really no doubt whatsoever that a reasonable person could not conclude any other way than, than um, in the manner of the, the finding that is proposed. So beyond a reasonable doubt, really no doubt whatsoever. Um, that's the highest. The lowest, the sort of the least amount of evidence re required, is preponderance of the evidence, and that's what's ordinarily used in civil actions. So you've got the criminal one, beyond a reasonable doubt, civil actions, ordinarily uh, preponderance, and that means, um, I'm just quoting from a couple of uh, cases in law dictionaries, preponderance of the evidence means a degree of evidence that, while not sufficient to free the mind wholly of all reasonable doubt, is still more convincing than the opposing evidence and is sufficient to incline a fair and re impartial mind to one side of the issue rather than the other. Burden used in most civil trials, and generally uh, says in order, the jury is instructed to find for the party that on the whole has the stronger evidence, however slight the edge may be. So it could be just a very slight difference, more likely one than the other. Sometimes in percentages it has been referred to as 51 versus 49 percent, you know, just barely one side or the other. That's the preponderance standard. So there, you got your two two uh, extremes there, right? The lowest and the highest. Middle one, clear and convincing. Sometimes used in different statutes. The legislature will do it. Sometimes uh, the court will um, uh, require the standard as well. Clear and convincing evidence means evidence indicating that the thing to be proved is highly probable or reasonably certain. So that's the sort of terminology that's often used. Highly probable or reasonably certain. And this is sort of self-evident, but of course, it's stronger evidence than a preponderance, but less evidence than a reasonable doubt. <laughs> so <laughs> that sort of locates where it is on the continuum, right? But um, that's sort of the sense of it. And in some ways, they're. they're can, I, can I keep going? Yeah. So this is a civil action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it is it unique to have a clear and convincing? You mentioned that it's mostly that preponderance is typically done in civil. Is it unique to civil to have clear and convincing used? By unique, do you mean it would never come up in a criminal situation? No, as in, do we, if typically in civil cases, right. preponderance is what's used. Right. What we're seeing here is being the threshold is clear and convincing. So right. it's asking for a higher threshold. Correct. Is that unique or unusual? Uh, no, I think it's, it's. I would say it was less common than preponderance, certainly. Uh, but that it's it's common for the legislature in certain situations. For example, I'm just thinking of one just because I was just talking about it this morning in a, in a different context. But for example, uh, the civil commitment standard uh, in Title 18, when a person is civilly committed uh, for involuntary mental health proceedings is a clear and convincing standard. Um, involuntary medication is a clear and convincing standard. Um, so the legislature, it's not unusual as a policy choice. It's certainly totally up to you. Right. But it's not unusual for the legislature. But there's, there's precedent for doing it in this, in this area. Yeah. Um, another question is sort of trying to compare um, different rights and sort of when we're the standard that's used to look at what's necessary to take away a right from someone. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the standard for uh, a search warrant? Probable cause. So it's ordinary. even a lower threshold. 
Uh, probable cause is interesting. Is is. Uh, um, it's a it's a different um, formulation because it's it's uh, it's it is a burden of proof, and you could say it's somewhat similar. It bears elements of, of some of the others, but it's um, because it comes up in a different context. It doesn't necessarily fit neatly into the preponderance, clear and convincing, beyond a reasonable doubt sort of continuum. You know, sort is of there a better? Is there a better example that I should be asking of what the burden of proof required to take away a right from someone? No, but I think, uh, as it happens, that's um, exactly what the courts have said with respect to the other issue I just mentioned, because I happen to have been reviewing some cases about uh, involuntary commitment and uh, that sort of thing, and the court specifically said, you know, you're taking away somebody's so liberty yep. interest. Yep. Exactly. And, and for and that reason, that you need a higher threshold. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Eric, um, is there a definition for probable cause, or how would you explain probable cause? There is. Um, that one I was going to kind of wait, just because okay. later on in the bill, you'll see it's set up that uh, the warrants are based on probable cause in one situation and reasonable suspicion in another. I'll give you a little preview now, though, uh, but I'll get to that in a little more detail. But I guess in a nutshell, the, yeah. the, the courts have said that clear and convincing evidence is a is a appropriate threshold for removing a, a right from someone who yes. has the right to leave. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So I'll put that probable sure. cause and yes. suspicion yes. on this, unless it's, unless you prefer to hear so it now. I, I, yep. That's fine. Great. So you want to do that. Sounds great. Thanks. So that's the one piece of the order that we're, we're talking about, right? That the uh, relinquishment generally stays in, take out the the examination of the defendant by the judge, but put in that there has to be a clear and convincing finding um, that relinquishment is not required to protect safety. That's the proposal. Second piece, uh, similar, remember, also had a piece in the order that it would be required to prohibit the defendant from residing at a residence where firearms are present. This is just the same language we just looked at. Again, provides the court an out uh, to say, well, it doesn't have to necessarily prohibit the defendant from residing at those residences it's because the option is established here, proposed I should say here, for the court to make a written finding that by clear and convincing evidence, relinquishment is not required to protect the safety of the victim of the public. So based on the particular circumstances, whatever they may be, um, uh, it looks like uh, residing at the residence is not going to be necessary, then the court doesn't have to include that in the order as long as there's a finding that um, that could be done without impacting public safety or victim safety. That makes sense, everybody, how that works? No changes to the next piece. The, the, this is just the information piece that has to be in the order to inform the defendant that they're prohibited from possessing firearms. That's the same as it was. There is a new provision order, though. You see, this is uh, not lines 9 through 11. This uh, is added to the order. And this would be that if the order does require relinquishment <coughs> of firearms, remember, because it's an if, because you just we just proposed in, in subdivision one up there, relinquishment may not be required, right? If the court finds, well, by clear and convincing evidence, not necessary to protect uh, safety, then there wouldn't order relinquishment. And if, uh, but this subdivision four says, well, if the, quarter, if the order does require relinquishment, then there has to be information included in it regarding the type and location of firearms uh, subject to the order. I should say all available information. So it doesn't require a, uh, a proactive search. <laughs> Just that if there's information available about uh, you know, the nature, the types of firearms, and where they are, that has to be in the order when it's issued. So we talking make, model? What are we talking about there? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, it's not specific about that. It just says type and location. Um, you know, it's, you might you might want more clarity there. That's a good possibility. That's a good point. Um, Throw in serial number while you're at it, please. Yeah. Make model. So that's the fourth piece. That um, uh, I have a question, um, or, or maybe more of a comment. It seems that the information required in the, that section we're talking about, lines nine to eleven, uh, presumably could be coming from 
the, the uh, affidavit in support of the relief for abuse, uh, and that's addressed at page nine. It's, it's, it's the same language, essentially, slight change, <coughs> seven to 12. And, and there it talks about plan of stating with particularity the type and location of any firearm. So that clarifies. Again, it doesn't say model number or anything like that, but that's tied to this. Right, because it says with particularity, there's some specificity required there, yeah. So you'll see, uh, everybody ready to move on from there? So you see you have a lot of struck language here, right? All the stuff, the second half of that page and a uh, good portion of the next page is all struck. And what this had to do with was the search warrant issue. Remember there was a big discussion under the previous draft this, a search warrant could issue at the same time as the relief from abuse order. So at the same time the RFA was issued, temporary or emergency, the court could also issue a search warrant, uh, and a, a warrant for actually for the search and seizure of firearms from the defendant, the court found probable cause to believe that the defendant had firearms. So it would happen at, at that stage of the proceeding, right, when the uh, uh, relief from abuse order was issued, the court was given the authority to issue the warrant. So the language, you see the language is struck here, so that's taken out. So this proposal does not have uh, a warrant being issued at that time. It's moved to later in the process, and we'll get to that in a moment. But So you see it's struck, it doesn't mean it's taken out of the bill entirely, but it's struck from this stage of the process, and, it, and the warrant option is provided later in the proceedings, after the um, officer has served the order. And if at that, we'll get to the details of it, but the big picture is, after the law enforcement officer serves the relief from abuse order, which is what happens now under current practice, that's the way it works, but after that happens, if the officer has probable cause or reasonable suspicion to think that um, the person does have firearms, then you sort of track into the path of how a warrant might be issued. Does everybody see that, how it's, a bit, how it's later in the proceedings? It's not when the order gets served, it's afterward that the, that the officer can go apply for a warrant. So that's the proposed change in the timeline in this draft. So we'll get to that in a moment. So it's struck from yeah, here. Eric, yeah. So what you're saying, is that uh, leaning more toward, um, I don't know the right terminology, but your standard due process? Or what I exists think, now, is that what you're... Yeah, the way, the, the, the new proposal, is that is that more the way things are usually done as far as due process goes? I think that... Um, Do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? I'm not uh, even sure, so... <laughs> no, no, I, I think maybe what you're getting at is it's more of a, of a search and seizure issue. You're right, it's a constitutional issue, but, but I think the, the reason it was um, uh, sort of a novel approach in the way the, the language is written at first is because the warrant is issuing uh, before there's necessarily probable cause to believe that the person's committing a crime, right. right? And that's why that language was in there. Remember, I discussed this New Jersey Supreme Court case, which had sort of said, well, under these circumstances, you can issue the warrant at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So um, this, this approach, because it moves it later in the proceedings, right. at that point, there is going to be, if the court's going to issue a warrant, there is going to be probable cause to think that a crime's being committed. So you've moved it to a stage in the proceedings where you don't have that concern anymore. Okay. And that, I think, is kind of addressing what you're getting at. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, as uh, Representative Lamont was mentioning, uh, one of the sections that was in the bill previously also has to do with um, the form complaints that uh, the court has for relief from abuse. They have these forms that uh, people fill out now. and this put some specific language in there that what, what um, the complaint and the affidavit have to include, and this is sort of line 16-ish, include specific provisions collecting information about the defendant's firearms. Now the one change here, and then, and then line 18 is what Representative Law mentioned, including that requiring the plaintiff to state for with particularity the type and location of fire. And Representative Gossin just kind of goes to what you were chatting, asking about as well, that particularity point. Um, the proposed change here is that as originally drafted, the questions uh, to the plaintiff, to the person asking for the relief from abuse order, required uh, him or her to state with particularity the type and location of any firearms, right? Um, this changes the required permit. So not necessarily, requ not required that the plaintiff answer these questions, but it permits the plaintiff to 
answer those questions. Uh, this next section is the emergency relief from abuse orders. Everything we just went through in terms of the language regarding relinquishment, residence, um, information about location of firearms, that all applied to the temporary, uh, sorry, to the final orders. This section deals with emergency orders, the ones that um, can be issued by the court uh, to the plaintiff with the defendant not present in the, in the initial stage, and they have to have a final hearing within 14 days afterward. Now, this is just the same language as we just went through, so there's no, this is the, exactly the same points that I already mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go back to the um, civil commitment yep. language. Do we allow for that to happen without the defendant there? Yeah, similar. So um, the other question that I have is, Sort of who has the burden of proof in this under uh, this bill or this proposed amendment? I believe the court uh, it looks like the the way it's phrased now, the court has to make you mean the clear and convincing so who has to prove to that standard for And in both sections, I guess, because they're the same. I would read that as requiring the defendant to show by clear and convincing evidence that, you know, sort of to put it in more uh, everyday terms, the defendant would have to show by clear and convincing evidence you don't need to take my firearms in order to protect either the victim or the public. Okay. So, so then going back to the civil commitment, someone's... You know, I don't know the process for who can initiate that action, but someone's trying to civilly commit me. Who has the burden of proof in that situation to remove that right? Liberty? Right. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> because the exact nature of who has the burden of proof is something that's being discussed downstairs in that context right now. And, and the answer is, it can depend on the proceeding. So, for example, in the civil commitment proceeding, in other words, not related to um, a person <coughs> who's been found not guilty by reason of insanity, because you think of how someone might be committed. They, can, they could be committed civilly, had no crime involved at all. You have an uh, uh, interested person, doctor, family member can go to the family division and get a, uh, an order for commitment of somebody because they're dangerous to themselves or others. In that case, the person seeking the commitment has the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence. But that would be closest to this because we're talking about someone. We're not talking about a criminal <coughs> situation. We're talking about a civil action. This is a civil action. Right. Yep. Yep. That's so true. So it would probably be closest to. I mean, the fairest. The fairest comparison would be to take it to civil group. Would you say? Uh, I think. It's one of those um, eye of the beholder, perhaps, situations. I think it, maybe it's more analogous in the, in the sense that they're both civil, but uh, because there's sort of an underlying um, crime, because here it actually is a crime for the person not to, not because you, I should say, it's proposed to be a crime. Because right? Right. there's language in here that proposes it to be unlawful. For the to be a crime, then our standards get all out of whack because then we have to go to that beyond a reasonable doubt standard. Well, right? interestingly, no, so that's what I was going to say. In in the uh, in in some situations, sort of going back backtracking just a little bit, the person who was um, been found not guilty by reason of insanity, and they want to and they're uh, committed to treatment, they have to show they have the burden. To show, they can have the burden of showing by clear and convincing evidence or preponderance that they're no longer in need of treatment. But they were in a criminal court to get there. Correct. OK. So we're not in criminal court for this proceeding. We're in, we're in a civil action. So right. Removed. Not at this stage. Right. Right. At this stage of where, where if, someone's, if some Vermonter is being impacted by this, they're in a civil action. So in a civil action, do I have? There's a civil action to 
uh, commit me, which I'm sure there's many people around this table that would like to do. <laughs> the, um, do I have to prove to clear and convincing, clear and convincing evidence that I do not need to be committed in order for that action to not happen? No. No. No, the state has to prove by clear and convincing evidence in that situation okay. that you are a danger to yourself or others and therefore should be committed. So in that case, to remove the right of liberty, we've said that the defendant does not have to prove to clear and convincing evidence the, the plaintiff or whoever. I, this is a problem whenever someone who isn't a lawyer tries to talk in the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> but the other person would have to prove that I should have my liberty removed. Correct. And in this case, we're saying that I would have to prove that I should not have my Second Amendment rights taken away. I, I would have to prove that. The other person would not have to prove that. That's the way this is written. I think that's fair to yeah. okay. Thank you. So, Eric, since we're using um, civil commitment as a comparison, um, what's the timelines? How often is somebody committed for the orders? Is it, I'm just wondering if it's really apples to apples in terms of a civil commitment procedure and what's here in terms of the time frame. Um, you know, is it 10 days, is it 14 days, is it up to a year in terms of when somebody is civilly committed, can be civilly committed? Uh, the timeline is if the, uh, the initial order um, can be up to 90 days and then within that 90 day period there has to be uh, a subsequent review to determine again whether the person's danger to themselves or others. And then if they, the court says they are, and they will remain committed, then the next order um, can be uh, up to a year. So they can be then committed on continuing orders of up to a year at a time. Can I just back up a little bit before the emergency relief? On page 6, um, D, that language was struck about law enforcement agencies shall be immune. Yes, but that's going to be, that it's only moved. You'll see it, it's still in the bill. It's, it's, it's still in the bill, just a few pages down. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Everybody okay so far? So, as I was mentioning, the, the changes to the emergency orders are, are the same as the changes that we already went through until, <coughs> with respect to the final order. So again, immediate relinquishment, required unless the court makes the clear and convincing uh, finding that we were just talking about. Same thing with the residents. Can't reside at a residence where firearms are present unless the court makes the clear and convincing finding. No change to the, the basically information piece of the order, which is informing the defendant that they are prohibited from possessing <coughs> firearms. And again, the same, the same language is added that we mentioned uh, in the final order context as well. And that's if the order requires relinquishment of firearms, again, because the order may not, but if it does, it has to include all available information regarding type and location. Again, the warrant language is struck here because the warrant is not being issued at this stage of the proceedings anymore. It's being moved further on. So again, it's, it's moved, uh, and you'll see it appear later on, but for purposes of thinking of the chronology of when this happens, the warrant wouldn't be issued at this stage, so it doesn't... Uh, shouldn't, the language shouldn't appear here anymore, then it doesn't. Yeah, sure. Sorry, <clears throat> I, I'd just like to back up uh, kind of relative to the conversation uh, with Matt. Um, could you explain the, the standard uh, that the legislature is under with respect to any kind of regulations uh, related to firearms? You know, what did the Heller case and subsequent cases establish? Uh, you mean the standard of how laws are <coughs> are reviewed with respect to the Second Amendment? In other words, sort of the right, the, right. As far as rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, right. uh, strict scrutiny. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, it, it, yeah. And the reason is, I mean, that we're establishing the presumption here that firearms are to be relinquished unless uh, there's this other showing. Right. Um, I mean, there are certainly the questions of burden of proof in the court, but I think an important burden for us to be watchful of is is the burden on the legislature as far as 
what we can do, what's the scope of our authority and ability to uh, regulate uh, firearms. Right. So uh, I think what Representative Lalonde is referring to <coughs> is um, the fact that because the uh, uh, possession uh, of firearms was held to be a personal right under the Second Amendment by the United States Supreme Court in the, in the Heller case, that means there are limitations on what steps and what laws the legislature can enact with respect to firearms. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't said much more since Heller to give states a little more, um, a little more uh, detail about what, how those limitations might look. Um, but uh, lower courts have, and so that's sort of been left to the Circuit Courts of Appeal to articulate what that is. So as it happens, there, the, in the New York State Rifle case, the Second Circuit, which is the circuit that Vermont sits in, adopted a mi an intermediate standard of review for firearms restrictions. So that means that, um, again, it's in the middle again. <laughs> similar in that sense, it's similar to clear and convincing. You know, the most, um, the most uh, uh, difficult standard of review, but that means the most, the most uh, difficult law for a legislature to pass would be subject to the most exacting judicial review is known as uh, you know, the compelling state interest, the uh, strict scrutiny standard of review. And it's often said among lawyers that if, if something is subject to strict scrutiny, that means it's pretty much going to be struck down because it's, it's, it's very difficult for a law to survive that level of judicial scrutiny. It means it has to be, the law has to be narrowly tailored to fit a compelling state interest. So there's two legs to that. It's to be very specifically <coughs> tailored to a, a compelling state interest. The lowest uh, standard is rational basis, which just means rationally related to a reasonable government interest. Complete opposite with that standard of review that almost always state laws are upheld under that standard because it's very easy to articulate uh, a reasonable government interest. Could you say that one more time? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to follow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just the lower standard. Yes, yeah. uh, rational basis. So reasonably, rationally related <coughs> to a legitimate government interest. And again, I'm sort of doing this on the fly. I hadn't, done, I hadn't researched this right for today, so I want to reserve the right to <laughs> correct my guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> later, 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 I think it's versus Cuomo. Okay. Uh, it's a Second Circuit case, uh, and that one said uh, that one said that for uh, for purposes of um, firearms regulation, you know, again going off of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Heller and Heller didn't say what the standard of review would be, so left that question open. That's why the lower courts have had to kind of wrestle with it, and not all courts have reached the same conclusion. But the Second Circuit, the one Vermont sits in said uh, intermediate scrutiny, which is the middle level of scrutiny, which I think is uh, substantially related to an important government interest, I think. Um, so again, you see some of this is semantics, right? So it's sort of like, how do you decide whether, some, whether an interest is important versus compelling versus reasonable, you know, or legitimate, I should say? Um, and how do you decide whether something is uh, narrowly tailored, substantially related, and sort of going down the, the tier by saying those, and that's just, but all I can say with that is that courts have been using those standards for many, many years, and um, they're familiar to, to litigants, and um, yeah, they're based on the facts and circumstances of a particular case, but um, you at least can speak generally to say that the, uh, the, the level of review that the court gives, in this case, the firearms regulation, um, is in the middle, as opposed to the most exacting or the most deferential. It's in the middle. <coughs> I don't understand what the like. I don't. I don't understand what the relevance is. Well, Could you well, explain that, Mark? Yeah, sure. I mean, the relevance is um, <coughs> that we are setting up this uh, procedure where there is a relinquishment of firearms, and if I can use your language, that giving up the right. Uh, to have firearms in a particular situation. Uh, and one should look at that with this concept in mind that it's substantially related to the important government interest. Um, I'm saying that that's as important, if not more important, of a standard to be paying attention to 
to whether we have preponderance of the evidence or clear and convincing evidence uh, for this other component of the bill. And if we're looking at what is the extent of our ability to address this, these rights uh, under the Second Amendment, it's with intermediate scrutiny. If somebody were to, to challenge, challenge right. if, if this were to pass, if somebody were to challenge, um, it's what would the court's review be of the legislation? And so that's sort of the overarching <coughs> thing to keep in mind in terms of um, constitutional viability. I mean, we can never say something is, right, you know, absolutely constitutional. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I wasn't trying to make a constitutional argument. I'm trying I to understand for myself. I right, just, no, I, no. The I last know. thing uh, me as a non lawyer would do is try to say whether I, No, I know you weren't, but I think. It's just two ways of looking at. Right. It's at the it. context of you know, you're yeah. really focused on preponderance convincing, which is important. I'm not denying, but it, I think that bigger <coughs> picture is something to keep in mind as well. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. So uh, we were just sort of finishing up the continued review of the language that's been the warrant language that's been moved from the initial stage of the proceedings to further down uh, the timeline when the officer serves the, the relief from abuse order. And typically, you'll see here that um, there's some new language. That I mentioned earlier that the, the court right now has forms for these relief from abuse complaints and forms for the orders. And you see that in the existing language right there, <coughs> line four, page nine. And this adds, uh, and, and typically there also are return of service returns of service that are used. And return of service means when the officer serves the warrant, or sorry, serves the order on the uh, on the defendant. And the order will say, you know, to stay away from the defend from the plaintiff or restrictions on uh, contact between the two parties, whatever the order happens to say. Uh, typically there is a return of service and that means that the officer takes the return of service and brings it back to the court. It shows the court that the order was served. So there's a record that this service happens, what a return of service means. And that <coughs> doesn't just happen in this case, it happens when warrants are served generally. It's, it's, a, it's a standard piece of uh, operating procedure in the court. So this adds, because you'll see what, what uh, the warrant piece here has been moved from the initial stage of the proceedings to further down the road when the officer serves the relief from abuse order, there's going to be some specifics in there about what the return of service has to say. And for that reason, return of service forms are added here to the list of orders that the court has to come up with. So there are going to be these forms that the court's going to have for the officer to use when they serve these orders. And also when they return service to the court and say, hey, the, the, warrant, the uh, RFA was served. And, the, and this piece of paper shows that it was. And you're, you're going to see that there's some substantive requirements of what has to be in it. But as an initial matter, this says, well, the court says to the court, have these forms ready for the officers <coughs> and the plaintiffs and the defendant and the plaintiffs primarily to use so that it makes it easier for people I think to operate this whole process. Um, so lines nine and ten we saw before that again this is the same thing that was in the in the final order section that we already looked at. Uh, the questions uh, on the complaint from relief from abuse and the affidavit don't require the plaintiff to state anything about the firearms but it permits the plaintiff to state that. No changes to section four, that's the new criminal provision around um, a person uh, who's subject to relief from abuse order uh, not being allowed to possess firearms, similar to the federal law in the sense that uh, the federal law already, <coughs> already prohibits someone from possessing firearms if they are subject to a final relief from abuse order. This one, uh, in addition, adds uh, the emergency temporary relief from abuse order. So for that, that person would be prohibited for purposes of Vermont law, but not federal. Whereas if it were the final order, you'd be prohibited by both. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So now we're moving on to now you'll see the warrants. This language added to the section just to sort of as the title, because that's this is where the warrants piece is being added to, to service. So it's not happening uh, at the beginning when the order is initially issued, you'll see that it's going to happen later on. So, um, as the, 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 this is highlighted here, but actually that's existing law, lines 11 through 17. I just highlighted the whole subdivision there because it's 
for some changes being made to it overall. But there is some, this is existing language that, uh, and you may, we talked about this too, uh, this initial piece right here, actually, um, was discussed when the committee was talking about the domestic violence bill, committee bill. I mean, there were some separate domestic violence issues that were being talked about in the committee bill, and, they were, and there was discussion of what's known as the once served, <coughs> always served language. Everybody remember that? We went over the language in the context of this other bill. It's moved into here, and that concept was that one, um, when a person is served with a temporary relief from abuse order, and by service, that means they are personally served by a law enforcement officer. Remember, we just talked, and then they take the return of service, bring it back to the court, and say, okay, we served this person. Um, when that happens, the uh, same person in the same matter can be served with the final order by first class mail. I see that? So they've been served once already, uh, personally, uh, which is a constitutional requirement for due process. And they say one, but this allows the second, subsequent, because for example, let's say the person, and actually if you look at lines um, 14, through 60. So imagine sort of the chronology of how this happens. Frequently, um, if not mostly, at the emergency temporary relief from abuse order stage, the defendant's not there. Right? They're getting that from the court. The defendant's not there, but you have, the defendant has to have an opportunity to participate at the final hearing that has to be held within 14 days. So you get the final, the emergency one, there has to be a hearing set up within 14 days. The defendant has a right to be at that one. So, um, and remember, they're, you know, they have been personally served with the emergency order. So then, let's say the defendant does come to the hearing. That's lines 14 through 16 existing law. If they do come to the hearing, they'll be required to adhere immediately to the provisions of the order. And so, uh, and actually just above that line 13 to 14, if they're there and they've, they've already received notice, uh, they're deemed to have been served. In other words, you're there at the hearing, you hear everything that's going to be in the order, you're you're, in that case, you're going to require to adhere to it. It's obviously uh, comports with the process of arbitration for the, to assume that the person knows about what's just been said to them. And that's all, this is all existing. That's all existing, right. So um, this addresses a situation where, say, the defendant wasn't at the final hearing. They, were, they, they weren't at the uh, initial one, <coughs> because usually they're not. The, the law officer came, served, found them, served them personally. But they don't show up for the final hearing. Uh, in that case, uh, that's what this language addresses. It says, all right, well, um, uh, the court shall serve the order by, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped to, I skipped to line 20. Um, a defendant who has been served with a temporary order issued under section 1103, so in other words, they've already been served with a temporary order, right, may be served with all subsequent orders in the case by first class mail to their last known address. So in other words, they got served the first time, rather than require um, personal service the second time to someone who didn't show up at the final hearing, you can do it by mail. There's also a requirement that the defendant inform the court of any changes in their address, and uh, also the last line there that the subsequent order uh, shall be effective when it's issued. So again, similar to the, to the situation where the person was in the court, uh, in this case, if the person chooses not to be there, order can be mailed to him, and, and, he, and it's effective when issued by the court. Eric, I just had a quick question. Yeah. I know that um, I'm looking at line 18 on page 10. Yeah. I know that in other um, civil actions, uh, it's, it's the order is required to be served by certified mail so that the individual receiving it has to sign. Um, do you know why it's why it's being served in first class mail where they wouldn't, uh, they, they don't have to sign when it's first class mail, right? So, Correct. Um, I, I think my concern is how do we know that the person actually receives it if it's first class mail? I don't know if that's actually more for a committee discussion. Well, just for a little bit of background, the, um, um, the, the language here I think, and maybe I think you're hearing from someone from perhaps a judge from New Hampshire this afternoon, but it's based on a statute in New Hampshire. So just the reason why it's first class mail, I think that's what the New Hampshire statute said too. But it doesn't alleviate your concern necessarily. Certainly there are other places where the legislature can say, has said certified mail. So it's certainly an opt like you said, policy discussion for the committee. But the reason that it happens to say first class now, is I think it's just because that's what the New Hampshire statute said. So do, do we ever use first class in Vermont as opposed to certified? I'm sure. I don't. I don't. I don't know off the top of my head. 
But I, I think the answer to that is yes. Okay. Sometimes you do. And, um, Evictions is first class. I think so. It definitely is for um, towing and getting your title. Oh, yeah. For divorces, it's certified. Okay. For divorces, it's certified. You know, mm -hmm. case that turned into a giant issue. Yeah, it'll be good to find out where we do and don't, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt. Who's responsible for the cost of all the serving and the, if we change it to certified mail? And, would that be the plaintiff? Does it uh, work? So it doesn't need the cost of that. It's usually. I'm not sure the answer to that. That'd be a good question for the witnesses. I, I don't know. Okay, my concern yeah. would be that in situations like this, I don't want to put an undue financial burden on a person seeking relief from abuse to sort of, you know, to get someone served costs hundreds of dollars to begin with in the first place. So there's some sort of cost after that. I, I'd want to make sure that people can access this if they need to. Yeah, but I, uh, I mean, I definitely hear your point, but just a question for Eric. The way I'm reading this is right now, the law enforcement agency has to go physically serve the order versus in the proposed change here it can be mailed. So I'm, I can't imagine that's not a like, oh, reduction of cost no, no, savings I, all around. I understand right? that. I'm actually supportive of the language of first class mail in this, in this case. Okay. I'm, I'm, the, this, okay. this change I like. I would be, if, if the burden of, if the financial burden applies to the plaintiff, I wouldn't want to make it tougher. I see. Probably a question for Jeff Yeah. Um, so we talked about so the, the changes in the in the the way in which the order is transmitted to the defendant. Now we're going to move on to the warrant issue. As we as I mentioned earlier, we moved to this subsequent stage in the process, um, and I'll go through this language since it's sort of uh, it should be familiar because we looked at very very similar language initially when it was part of the order itself, but it's some differences here, so let's take a close look at how we read now. So the idea is that when, as I mentioned, when the order is served, that's when this uh, law enforcement officer is going to also uh, accompany the order with this return of service form, okay? And you see that lines 19 through 20, though this is, uh, goes back to, as you, you were just saying, that the, there has to be a form, right, now for the return and service form, and that makes sense because there's going to be some specifics that have to be on that form. You see it right, right there on line 19 and 20. The law enforcement officer has to indicate with specificity whether firearms were, were relinquished by the defendant. So uh, it's a, it would be a new element of the form because the their returns of service happen already, but this requires there to be something additional on the form, and that has to say some indication, some specific indication, of whether or not firearms were relinquished. Here they were, they weren't. Now, then goes on to say, okay, that's the case. When you think about the chronology, the officer serves the order, gonna have to put on the order whether or not firearms were relinquished. Now, now one possibility, of course, is that the, that the firearms are relinquished, right? That's one thing that could happen. If they don't, <coughs> that subdivision two kicks in. If the defendant does not relinquish firearms upon service of the, of the order, and the law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe the defendant possesses, owns, or controls firearms. but see that? So they're serving the order, they don't relinquish, but the officer has probable cause to think this person still has firearms. Then, uh, I'm on line three, the officer is required to submit the return of service form to the court, along with an affidavit requesting that a warrant for seizure of the firearms be issued. Now, at that point in time, you think about uh, what we just looked at, the language that makes it a crime for a person to possess a firearm while they're subject to a relief from abuse order. At that point in time, if the officer has probable cause to think that the person still has firearms because they've been served with the order and it's a crime to possess firearms at that point, the officer has PC, has probable <coughs> cause to think that the person's committing a crime. See that? At that stage of the game, there is probable cause to think that the person's committing a crime. As opposed to, remember when we looked at it earlier, it was a little squishier in that 
uh, that question <clears throat> when it was happening earlier in the proceedings. Because they have this probable cause, there's uh, under, uh, you know, it's well established that the court uh, has the basis for issuing a warrant in that situation. Because if, there, if the officer has probable cause to think that the person's got firearms um, at that point. But so, the officer still needs to submit this to the court. The, correct. The, the officer can't do anything right then and there. That's right. That's right. Officer has to go back to the court with the return of service and say, uh, with an affidavit, say, I've got problem. Here's what I think. You know, with a ordinary <clears throat> the affidavit, whatever facts and circumstances support the officer's belief that the person still has firearms have to be in the affidavit. Go back to the court. Court looks at it um, uh, and can then issue the warrant. And does say uh, the return of service in the affidavit shall be filed with the court at the earliest possible time and shall take precedence over other summonses and orders. And the idea there is obviously a, a, uh, a speedy, to try and speed up the proceedings at that point. Yeah. Matt. Is that typical? Yes, that's done sometimes as well. In fact, it's already, if you look, uh, the service, uh, what is that? Um, Uh, there was something in here already about, uh, oh, there it is. So if you see the existing law so on we, page 11. Okay, so yeah. we, we do that of taking precedence for serving the provincial use orders. Exactly. Okay. Right there. Yeah. So it's consistent. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, because I'm going to ask them that in the next section, I'm going to ask the same questions so if you want to just talk about that. The next section being the... The next paragraph. Oh, right. Um, the 48, 48 hours. Oh, right. So, yeah, uh, the uh, um, so the return of service has to come back to the court, has to be, take precedent over other summons and orders. Now, again, um, this is a, a different... You're sort of looking at two and three again here for a moment on the legal standard. You see, the, the difference here in the very beginning is subdivision two... Uh, the person doesn't relinquish, but the officer has probable cause to think they've got firearms. So that is your uh, initial fact. When that happens, the officer has to submit an affidavit uh, and for a warrant to be issued. But Subdivision 3 is a slightly different scenario. Defendant doesn't relinquish, but the officer has a reasonable suspicion that the defendant possesses or owns firearms. Now, obvious question is, well, wait, what's the difference between reasonable suspicion and probable cause, right? So, because they're different. They're different evidentiary thresholds. And the idea is uh, there is more evidence that will support a probable cause finding, <coughs> and less evidence will support a reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion will not support a warrant, in other words, legally speaking. Um, probable cause does. So, uh, as the courts have often said, <laughs> The probable cause standard is incapable of precise definition or quantification in the percentages because it deals with probabilities and depends on the to totality of the circumstances. However, the various efforts to define the, and that's a quote from a Vermont Supreme Court case, by the way, and, and a U.S. Supreme Court case as well. The various efforts to define the term typically rely on the same concept. Probable cause means there are reasonable grounds for a belief and that the belief must be based on particular facts and circumstances. Those are quotes from couple of Vermont Supreme Court cases. The U.S. Supreme Court made, made a similar point. Articulating precisely what reasonable suspicion and probable cause mean is not possible. <laughs> so I put that out there as <laughs> an immediate uh, principle to keep in mind. But the court went on to say, they are common sense, non-technical conceptions that deal with the factual and practical considerations of everyday life on which reasonable and prudent people, not legal technicians, act. As such, the standards are not readily or even usefully reduced to a neat set of legal rules. So, obviously, it depends on the particular facts and circumstances of each case. Having said that, um, the court went on to say, in a different case, reasonable suspicion, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so generally probable cause means reasonable grounds based on particular facts and circumstances. Particular facts and circumstances, reasonable grounds. Reasonable suspicion is a less demanding standard than probable cause, not only in the sense that reasonable suspicion can be established with information that is different in quantity or content than that required to establish probable cause, but also in the sense that reasonable suspicion can arise from information that is less reliable than that required to show a probable cause. So there can be 
less of an amount of information, and the information itself can be less reliable than the, than the facts and circumstances that would go toward probable cause. Um, so those are concepts that are useful to keep in mind, because as you see, the two procedures that are proposed in the legislation depend on which standard, which, which threshold of proof exists. In the first one, if the threshold is these more uh, particular facts and circumstances, the evidence is more, um, more established, then uh, the court, I'm uh, sorry, the officer, and the officer has probable cause based on those facts, then the officer goes to the court, submits the affidavit, can get a warrant. Directly. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, but if they don't have enough evidence, either not enough or the evidence isn't, isn't similarly reliable, they don't have probable cause, but they do have a reasonable suspicion, some other lower level of, uh, of, of evidence, then there's a different requirement, and that's line 10s and 11, what you were just referring to, line 10 and 11. Officer is required to investigate the matter within 30, within, sorry, within 48 hours or as soon as practical. If the officer determines that there is probable cause to believe the defendant has firearms, in other words, they conduct this initial investigation and gather more evidence, determine, oh, uh, now this, my level of, um, of uh, belief about this has risen to the probable cause standard, then they, um, lines 13 and 14, they submit the return of service pursuant to subdivision two. That just means they follow the process we just talked about. They develop probable cause, they go back to the to the procedure we just mentioned, they fill out the affidavit, they bring the return of service, they ask the court for a warrant. But uh, if they don't, this line's 14, they don't determine that probable cause exists, so they've conducted this initial additional investigation, haven't come up with any additional evidence or enough to uh, justify asking for a warrant, they still submit the return of service, uh, but they have to include a statement that describes the efforts that were made to establish probable cause during the investigation. So it has to be something in the statement that says, well, I tried A, B, and C, but still, didn't get enough facts to, to develop probable cause. So those are the two tracks. So then it goes to the court, right? And this is subdivision four. This is, and then again, this is virtually identical language to what you looked at previously when it was earlier in the proceeding, but now it's later on. So the court has to issue the warrant if, uh, if the court finds there is probable cause to believe, A, there's firearms in the defendant's possession or ownership or control while the order is in effect, remember, that's illegal under another provision of the bill. And in fact, in some circumstances, already illegal under federal law. Um, and uh, that a search is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of the victim. Again, that language is tracked on that New Jersey Supreme Court case, uh, similar provision there. And then, uh, just real quick point, Representative Gosselin, you'll see there, uh, the immunity language you had mentioned earlier, that it's all down here now as well. We've got some new immunity language, an additional immunity I want to mention, but the, the, what you had, you had <coughs> identified earlier, that's lines 11 to 16 now. So it just got moved from a different place in the bill <coughs> to forward to here. Actually, and lines 8 through 16 are all identical, it's just moved. So Eric, this is a two-part test, the warrant is issued if A and B? Correct. Yep, exactly. So, the law enforcement agency may be immune from civil or criminal liability for damage or deterioration. So let's talk about municipalities. Are they equipped to handle storage for these without deterioration? Um, I, th I think that's a um, not a question for Eric, but we will have, um, hopefully the commissioner will, will address that. I mean, that's, some, that's an important question, but, right, Eric, I mean, that's not. Yeah, that's right. It's a good yeah. question, but not one that I yeah. have the answer to at my disposal. Yeah. <laughs> right. I didn't hear a discussion on the time. So does the, oh, right. does the, the legislature tell law enforcement the order in which they have to pay attention to different activities or their duties? Uh, so are you referring to the to the forty eight hour investigation piece? Yeah, that, it strikes me as strange that we're dictating the order in which law enforcement has to in, conduct an investigation, and that I, I don't know if that's something that 
the legislature does. Maybe there's some place in statute where we lay out priorities for <coughs> investigations, but I'm not aware of that. I'm not, I think, sort of to separate your question a little bit, in terms of prioritization of activities, I think, for example, sometimes saying, as we just well, saw. The, the service, exactly. yeah. That. But the 48 hour piece, I'm not also, I'm not thinking of another, I'll, I'll take a look, but, but that, that uh, I'm not thinking of another place where with that degree of specificity. Um, it does not say, say there isn't, I haven't looked, but I or think it's correct. But it does say it is, or as it is practical. Yeah, practice, I think that, but it's, it still strikes me as strange to, to put a time limit on something unless it's something that we typically do, because they're still looking at a 48 hour uh, standard. Well, Eric, maybe you can help us understand if it is 48 hours. Like, how, how does the 48 hours or as soon as practical? You know, how does, how does that line of work together? Uh, I think that uh, uh, <coughs> the or as soon as practicable language does modify 48 hours. Um, in what way a court would interpret that? I think they would have to view the 48 hours as not necessarily mandatory because of the option for as soon as practicable, but um, um, obviously it means something. Right. So uh, might be a good question for um, someone representing the branch who would make those decisions. <laughs> so, yeah, um, the word <coughs> Uh, we're laying out a requirement for how law enforcement uh, obtains the warrant. Uh, does this in any, in any manner impact the discretion that law enforcement has with respect to service of the warrant, other than saying this is a priority? In other words, it's discretion to determine uh, safety precautions for serving the warrant, timing of serving the warrant, etc. cetera. No, nope. no, it's just the only thing it's talking about is its relative priority. In process for getting the war. Sure, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> so one piece I, I did want to mention, because uh, it's another immunity piece. Uh, we I, I mentioned the, and, and Representative Gosselin mentioned as well, uh, the existing, and this does exist already because of this whole process for uh, when firearms are subject to seizure for relief from abuse orders. There's a separate section of law that uh, was dealt with several years ago that does provide for how they are transported and how they are stored. And that, that language is just is repeated right here in lines 8 through 16. And that existing procedure also does provide for immunity to law enforcement agencies for any, any deterioration or damage that happens while they're seizing it, sorry, with transporting and storing it, that kind of thing. But this provision here is new, and this is lines three through, three through seven, some additional immunity for law enforcement agencies uh, because of sort of tied to these additional requirements that they um, are searching for firearms uh, on the basis of RFA. So this provides them immunity uh, from civil or criminal liability for, this is line four, for failing to learn of, locate, or seize a firearm <coughs> while executing a warrant. So it's not just to do with the transportation and storage. If you know, while executing the warrant, they haven't learned about or found it or seized it, uh, they can't be sued for that, uh, as well as they have immunity for anything that happens while they're returning a seized weapon to it, or sorry, for returning a seized weapon to its owner, uh, provided the owner is not a prohibited person from possessing firearms. So in other words, if they end up returning it, they can't be sued for that either, as long as the person isn't prohibited. <coughs> so I read this as saying they, because it's an or, right? That they could learn of and locate the firearm and just not seize it and still not be held liable under this provision? Um, I think it's for failing to learn of. But it says failing to learn of, comma, locate, or seize. So I, I guess I'm asking if the seize operates independently of the learning of and locate. Oh, I see what you Like, mean. could they just say, <coughs> yep, it's there. It's, it's, I mean, does it just provide a blanket mm -hmm. immunity? 
um, in the instance that they're aware of the firearm and yep, choose that, not to seize it. Yep, I see what you mean. Uh, I don't think that's the intent of the language, but that <coughs> might be a uh, cleanup that we want okay. to make, if, assuming that the committee wants to keep it and not go that route. But yeah, there might be an ambiguity there that needs to be corrected. Thank you. Would it be corrected by just changing the or to and? I'm curious. I mean, that's something we can work on later, but. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Can you have to meet all three in a way? Okay, so we can bookmark that. Right. Um, so I think we hit most of the major content. Oh, so uh, there's some struck language here in subsection F. This is relating to, you may recall, this was uh, an, an initial thought in this proposal had been that there would be a separate proceeding, a show cause proceeding, uh, but that's not going to be uh, provided for anyway. It's not going to happen. So this, this was with some reporting language for the court to report on the number of show cause proceedings that happened, but since there aren't going to be show cause proceedings anymore, um, no reason to have the reporting requirement. So that's the end of the warrant section. <coughs> now we're moving on to, uh, and we're just about done, I believe that's, that's really the bulk of the changes between the past previous draft and this one. Now we're moving on to extreme risk protection orders. Remember, those are orders that uh, were established in Vermont law a couple of years ago that allow uh, a state's attorney or the attorney general to file in court for an order prohibiting the person from possessing firearms if the person's uh, essentially dangerous to themselves or others. That's essentially the standard. Now, the proposal here, uh, and you looked at this in the previous draft, was under, under the existing law that was passed a couple of years ago, it's only the state's attorney or the AG that can file for one of these ERPO orders. So the proposal in the language that you looked at last time was to expand that to include family and household members, which a number of other states do as well. So the, the change in this draft is keeps that, that option. So a family or household member could still file for an ERPO. But the difference is, you'll see line 15, that if it's filed by a family or household member, it has to be done during the court's regular business hours only. So that's the proposal. Can I just back up and ask the question, if you if you um, address this in line, my yep. was flipping out during it, I apologize. But on page 14, before we move into maybe literally just said this. On page 14, before I move into the ERPO provisions, yep. why are lines 9 through 12 struck? Because under a previous thought with the bill, there was going to be a procedure known as a show cause hearing. That's not oh, the case anymore. Say that. yeah, so, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Catching up to you, Eric. No, that's okay. <laughs> you caught my language ambiguity earlier. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara. So, can you speak to why? And maybe I need to ask the the, 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 the presenters of the amendment why it changed business hours. That's probably a better question for witnesses. The, the why, I think. Okay. generally speaking, I think it has to do with accessibility of. Uh, court staff to receive these applications. <coughs> so, so it's the concern that uh, Judge Grierson uh, raised during his testimony as far as after hours with respect to that. I'm just, so what happens because I imagine more family members would be doing this outside of um, business hours. So it might be somebody gets drunk at night and gets fired. So I'm just wondering how are people who might be very vulnerable after business hours? They would need to go through law enforcement, essentially. The current process that we use to okay. right now. I mean, it's not for okay, calling so after hours. It's just that there has to be one person, the state's attorneys, between the, the okay. individual so we're not and the court, essentially. saying to them, we need to wait till tomorrow morning. Correct. Only if they want to file it directly themselves. Uh, that's actually, that's actually it. 
Um, the um, all the rest of the it's just you know adding the family or household member in each instance was um, necessary. Oh, this this doesn't change either. You may recall this is a there's also a provision that remains in the in the ERPO section having to do with permitting health care providers to notify law enforcement officers when they think uh, information is necessary to be disclosed uh, when there's a serious or imminent threat to the health or safety of a person as a result of firearms. And that's uh, uh, intended to make sure that that information can be passed along without violating HIPAA, the Federal Health Privacy Act. And that does not change from the previous draft that you looked at. <coughs> Nor is the conditions of relief section, conditions of release section, sorry, which uh, provides that uh, one of the conditions of release that a court can order would include uh, requiring the defendant not to possess firearms or other weapons. And that's just, that's codifying. <coughs> Courts can do that now. Correct. Yes, that's right. But they may, but again, in terms of consistency and what we often refer to as geographic justice. <laughs> right. It, it may not, you know, the concern is that it, not your concern, my concern, and that is just that it may not be happening to him. So this codifies, standardizes. I think that's right. <coughs> Well, thank you, Eric. That was very thorough. I know the committee really took a while, but oh, I think it's you. I think it was important to yeah. Yeah. make yeah. sure everybody understands what's here. So for the record, my name is Jeffrey Wallen. I'm the director of the Vermont Crime Information Center with the Department of Public Safety. Um, and as typical, I'm really here to answer any questions. I do have a few statistics that may be of interest. Um, to the committee. Um, I did work with some colleagues at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the NICS section, who were actually due to firearms checks to gather some Vermont-specific uh, statistics. So I'm able to share those uh, with the committee to start the discussion. From January 2017 until November 2019, which is the latest I can get statistics, unfortunately I couldn't get all of 2019. They didn't quite have December's numbers ready yet. Um, there were, uh, so during that period, so basically 35 months or almost three years, there were 111,519 firearms checks done in Vermont. So on a period of three years, which is an average of 3,186 per month. During that period, the average number of denials per month were 23. So of the 3,186, 23 of those checks resulted in denials um, for the firearm purchase. And the percentage of checks completed within three days of the initial request was 97.93% that are completed within the three-day time. Additionally, uh, just to put a sense of scale on this, during those same 35 months nationally, there were 76,850,007 firearms checks conducted during that same period. So you can see we're a small fish in that much larger pond um, of that. So I was able to work with some colleagues at the FBI to get some of those Vermont specific statistics, and I thought that might be useful to have a sense of scale um, as any discussion around this moves moves forward. <clears throat> Thank you. Did, did you have any information regarding uh, the, those that were not completed within three days and resulted <clears throat> in a denial or you know, sent to ATF for a retreat? Uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to get any information on the numbers that were sent for retrieve. I can reach out to the ATF on that, and that's a separate, uh, a separate inquiry, but I can reach out to ATF on that. And just one other question about, would the ATF have uh, any information on uh, why they were retrieved or why they received the retrieve, the basis, you know, what, what the prohibition was that they determined, I guess. Is the I won't speak for them, but I don't know that they would. My guess is they're simply going to receive a notice from the FFL and or the FBI that the retrieve is needed. They're not going to go into why, necessarily. Mm -hmm. If the ATF has a question, they could potentially get that from the FBI. Um, part of the challenge with that, Representative, is there may be multiple reasons why someone is prohibited. Um, 
just as a refresher, there are, and I know uh, Eric spoke about this before, there are a number <coughs> of categories which, which someone may be prohibited and they may fall in multiple boxes. Um, some of them are more easy to identify. If someone has multiple felony convictions, that's a fairly easy thing to identify. Um, if they are dishonorably discharged from the military, it might be harder. If they're one of 630 approximate individuals that have voluntarily given up their citizenship in the United States, those individuals are prohibited, may be more tricky to nail down um, on that. So there may not be a single reason, but multiple reasons why someone is denied. Um, a firearm, but uh, when I reach out to them, I'll ask them if they have any statistics on that, particularly for Vermont. Uh, there have been some national studies done, and those are useful, but they may not necessarily apply to any individual state. So, uh, I know one particular national study, the GAO report, and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that. Uh, <coughs> the Government Accountability Office uh, did a report in July of 2016 analyzing uh, data, and I don't know if you had a chance to, to, to look at that, have you seen that before? Or I did. I have seen that, and I did have a chance uh, to look at that. Any comments as far as, as uh, the, the bases and whether that's consistent with your understanding of what's happening in Vermont, or if you can't draw anything from it? I mean, if you're able to just explain that? The, the um Probably the best uh, perspective I can provide uh, around that is one of the focuses of the report was on uh, misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. And um, there's a definition that exists for that that may be more inclusive than individuals convicted in Vermont of a quote unquote domestic violence crime where domestic violence is part of the statute name and the relationship uh, thereof. And for those uh, particular crimes, there may need to be additional research that is done to determine whether or not a, a victim and an offender, for example, a simple assault, someone is convicted in Vermont of simple assault, if the nature of the relationship to the victim and the offender meets a federal definition of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence, that individual would be prohibited. Um, it wouldn't be on its face apparent just from the fact that an individual was convicted of simple assault that they were a prohibited person. That relationship may not exist. Um, that is one of the areas that requires the most legwork, as I understand from talking to folks at the FBI next section, where they have to do re reach out and research uh, on that. How VCIC comes into that particular discussion, if, it's, if the FBI next section is questioning that, um, they will reach out to us with information and we will point them um, to the investigating agency to get the narrative or to do any analysis that may help them make that determination. Um, for individuals in Vermont convicted of actually domestic violence statutes, we actually pre-flag those as prohibited at the state level. So we've removed as much uncertainty as we can from that, but there may be certain instances where it's still not clear. Uh, I would also take the, 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 the moment uh, to point out that in Vermont, we have what I call sometimes a reverse economy of scale. We're so small, we're able to do things that larger states may struggle with. We have a reasonably unified court system and a fairly robust uh, way that we exchange data with the courts. And talking with my colleagues in other states, just because of the either physical size or population base, they may not have a single streamlined path to get data from the courts to the criminal history repository, which is one of the things that the FBI uses when they're doing a query to determine if someone is prohibited or not. Um, we're fortunate that we have that, that good working relationship with the courts and that good data exchange so that, that uh, if someone is convicted in a Vermont court, chances are we hear about it fairly quickly and we can then make that available. In some states, that can be challenging. If in a remote town or county court that doesn't share data with the state more largely to run down, was this person actually convicted of a disqualifying offense? Um, we're fortunate in Vermont that we don't have to, to deal with that typically uh, very often. That would be, as I read through the report, one of the key things they were looking at. And that's something in talking with other states that has been a real, a real challenge, is how to try to pre-analyze um, certain misdemeanor convictions to see if they have a domestic violence component or not, which is something that's difficult for folks in a repository to do, because it may involve legal analysis of federal statutes, which we're not always uh, prepared to do. 
Um, kind of jumping around a little bit, but um, of course you mentioned the three days, and uh, that brought to my mind the default process. And I'm just wondering, I don't know if you have the numbers, and it's a kind of a two or three part question in a sense. Um, how many, in Vermont, how many firearms were, uh, I, I guess the term would be sold or, or, or taken into possession um, because of the default process? And in, out of those firearms, uh, uh, of course, how many were then had, uh, people had to be investigated because it turned out there was an issue with them, so they needed to, uh, the, the FBI needed to go take those guns. And was during that time frame when a prohibited person did end up with a firearm in Vermont, how many of those people committed a crime with a firearm? I'll start with the first question, which is probably the one I can most directly answer. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, my answer is going to be there's not really a way to know. Um, so after three days, um, as I understand it, a, a federal uh, firearms dealer, if they don't have a response back from the FBI NICS section, may release that firearm, but they're not required to. Right. Um, so it, it, to some degree, falls upon the judgment of that FFL. And I'm not sure that there's any way to necessarily track that short of speaking with FFLs directly and trying to have them analyze their records to determine when they did or didn't release a firearm to someone. There's nothing that we have at VCIC or that I'm aware of at the national level where they can simply provide some numbers uh, uh, around that. So unfortunately, I'm not sure um, how often that does or doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. Uh, there. That would then lead into it's very difficult to know um, how many individuals were potentially in possession of firearms when they, if I may use the term, shouldn't have been. Um, and then how many crimes were committed by those individuals, I'm not sure as well. It, it, there may be some... Is, is, you said it would be really difficult to get that information. It, it would be. Uh, it would be. Um, certainly from my perspective as the repository coordinator right. to, to get that information. Um, I'll give you an analogy that we sometimes are asked that may sort of be helpful where we have a lot of information, but drawing conclusions is challenging. I often get asked, um, how many crimes were committed in Vermont uh, so that the individual could then turn around and sell stolen property, uh, finances, etc., to use that money for to purchase drugs? There's no way for me to know with the burglary what the purpose of that was, short of reading case files to try to determine in this right. case was it, in that case was it. There's nothing in the statistics that necessarily just jumps out at you. Yeah, and to me that's kind of unfortunate because with the uh, default process changes that we're talking, if, if there's no no crimes committed in the end with a firearm that somebody wasn't supposed to have, um, fixing a problem we don't have. Colloquially, I, I we've all seen national incidents where this has happened. Um, it's been on the news where in the last couple of years there have been some shootings where an individual should not have had a firearm and they did. And It's uh, one of the areas where there have been some federal changes, uh, the Fix Nix Act, which may have come up to the committee prior. Um, from my perspective, primarily focused on federal data getting into the, <coughs> the federal government didn't always know what data they had because the federal government is a very large uh, institution. But also there were some work at the state level for us to look at our records to make sure we were getting as much as possible and making that available. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, in Vermont, we were in a strong position to make that data available when we have it um, to, the next, uh, to the next section. So we were in a good position, uh, a good position there. So I don't want to editorialize. We do know, unfortunately, there are instances where individuals get firearms where they shouldn't and yep. they do commit crimes, but the prevalence of that is somewhat difficult uh, to analyze. Okay, Martin. Yeah, yeah. So um, the 2.07 percent default proceeds. Uh, just to clarify, that's not necessarily because they had to look at a Vermont <coughs> record, uh, be it a misdemeanor or any other kind of thing. It could be. It would be a nationwide. So we don't know what the problem was necessary. It may not be Vermont. And I guess the, the question, for, well, if you can confirm that, but the question is, uh, do you know about uh, other states and quality of data from other states? It sounds like we do a pretty good job in Vermont getting our stuff into the NICS system on a timely basis, that we have a separate domestic violence crime that, that can easily be flagged. But what about other states? What's your knowledge of So sure, the, the initial question, um, 
Yes, for those two point uh, percentage of individuals that, that uh, or transactions, I should say, is a better way to phrase it, um, it may or may not have anything to do with a question in Vermont. Um, it could be that the individual, I'm from Tennessee, so I will default pick on my home state of Tennessee as an example. It may be that there was an arrest, an arrest even, um, uh, and an arraignment, an individual was arraigned for a felony, but they don't have a disposition was the person convicted or not. So they need to reach out to Tennessee to say, what happened with this? Was the person convicted of it or not uh, to get that information? Similarly, it may be that someone has a similar name or date of birth and they have a protection order or a warrant out for their arrest. And they need to verify that's not the same person. If there was a Jeffrey Wallen born, ninth, uh, born um, September 12th, 1973, my birthday is December 9th, 1973, they may want to check that to make sure it's not just a, a transposition in a warrant or a protection order case. So they may want to double check that just to make sure. Um, so it, it's any number of things, but it's not directly linked to an issue in Vermont. It's that between the 50 states, federal government, tribes, and territories, there may be some information that is not complete or unclear, and so the FBI next staff need to, to do that, that additional research. So for clarification uh, for myself, for Vermont <coughs> only, for domestic violence, how many cases in the last 35 months have involved firearms? So how many, <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? I want to make sure I understand what you're looking for. I'm only talking for one here on my question. <coughs> I think you said you have uh, information for the last 35 months. How many domestic violence <coughs> cases involved firearms in Vermont. So, so individuals uh, that were incidents of domestic violence involving firearms, is that what you're yes. looking for? I don't have that information available. I can certainly research it and see what we have. So you wouldn't know how many deaths uh, happened with firearms during that time either? Then. I wouldn't have that available. Well, we can, we can get that. I think we have had that testimony. <coughs> we can get that for you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it sounds like you're going to be reaching out to ATF to ask a couple of questions. Um, could I see if, there, if I could piggyback onto some of the requests there? Absolutely. Just figuring out, you know, what their um, uh, when they're when they're uh, sent over a retrieved order. Uh, how often that happens, and uh, in the in this state, and uh, what's their success rate in retrieving the firearm, and how long it typically takes? Anything related to those types of things, like how long? How long? Certainly, I'm absolutely happy to reach out uh, to them to find out the number. If they have any information on why, they may not, but I'll ask, uh, I'll certainly put the question, what their success rate in recovering those arms in, and how long it, it typically takes. So I'm happy to ask those questions and see what they have. And if they have anything else that's relevant, I'll certainly gather that as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Any additional questions I can answer? Maybe just one more thing, and I, I know it's been uh, asked, but you brought up to 35 months. I, again, in Vermont, I'd like to know um, how many domestic violence um, people have left their partner that caused this, then returned later, and then the bad stuff happened. They were killed. Or, I'm not sure that type of analysis. So if you're looking to see the number of individuals in the past 35 months that left the partner and then returned to commit some type of violence, is that? Well, they, the, the, uh, let's just say the, the woman um, was attacked or, or she filed the charges. And then she decided she dropped the charges and they're going to work things out and then 
it happened uh, again, only this time it involved a firearm. That's really what I'm looking for in that 35 month time. So maybe has has a final has a has a temporary <coughs> order, but doesn't doesn't pursue the final order. Right. She drops it. They move back in together. You know, the, everything's broken out <coughs> fine, and then trouble erupts more, and there's a, a bigger situation. I'm I'm not sure. Candidly, I'm not sure from the information we have if we could assign. Mm -hmm that type of motive just based on arrest uh, information. There might be others who do more comprehensive studies with domestic violence that might be able to speak to that. And if I can provide them any data, I'm happy to. But I wouldn't want to step outside of our expertise um, and provide you any inaccurate information. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I just, um, since we have you here, uh, if you could explain how our information from Vermont gets into the NICS system. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great question, and I, and I appreciate that. The, um, the way I describe the NICS section, and it's really a group of people, NICS isn't a single list of prohibited persons, but rather a group of people at the federal level that undertake analysis to determine if someone is ineligible or eligible to receive uh, a firearm. And to do that, they query multiple data sources, uh, and they have some fairly sophisticated architecture to do that. Uh, among those include federal criminal history databases, state criminal history databases, uh, the National Crime Information Center, which is where wants, warrants, protection orders, etc., are entered into as well. Then they will check military records. Uh, some, as I, I use it sort of as the um, individuals who have voluntarily given up their citizenship. That's the State Department that maintains that and makes that data available. Um, so Vermont provides our information to them uh, electronically, and it's it's really real time. We don't. There's no, we don't send anything in the mail, we don't email, we update our systems, and then uh, the FBI NICS section have uh, the data available to them at that moment, and there's no real lag to it. Um, so if, when I get back to the office, uh, the courts um, have sent over a file, and now uh, an individual is now prohibited because they have a felony conviction, um, then once that information is updated, which we do it uh, uh, daily um, when necessary, uh, that information is then available to the FBI to make that determination. And similarly, if someone has an expungement that, that's issued, once we process <coughs> that, it's also removed um, from the system as well. And how about uh, records of individuals who've been adjudged to be a danger to themselves or to others? <coughs> so that I would defer to the judiciary on, because they're the ones that provide that information to the next oh, section. Okay. I that do doesn't know, come through. That doesn't come through us, because it's not actually a criminal, uh, not a criminal matter. Uh, doesn't come through us. I do know, and I would again defer to the judiciary, they have a, uh, an automated process for that to make the data exchange fairly seamless, but I would defer to them on the operations and how that works. Uh, I don't expect you to know the answer, but you might. <laughs> and and uh, you might be able to find out. And it's got to do with uh, uh, what we're talking about, the fix. And one, one of the shooters a couple of years ago was dishonorably discharged, I think, from the Air Force, if I remember right. And uh, because things weren't done in, in the way they're supposed to, he never got into the system as being a prohibited uh, person. How was that fixed? So that particular, I believe that was the Fort Worth, Texas shooting. Yep. Uh, I believe that's if that's the case you're talking about. Um, as I understand in that instance, the um, the military branch in question, uh, I believe that individual was, actually had it was a domestic violence issue that led to their dishonorable discharge. Okay. And so that information was not shared with the FBI. It was kind of <coughs> siloed in, an Air, in a DOD or Air Force only database. Mm -hmm. So when that person went to the FFL and the FBI queried it, they had no visibility into that Department of Defense or Air Force data. Right. Um, part of that fixed NICS Act that I mentioned, which was a federal statute a few years ago, required various federal entities, including the Department of Defense, but any other as well, to make sure that the FBI had any data that they had available uh, to them and required some change at the federal level to make was, sure Was was fix NICS before that? A fix NICS was after that. After that, okay. That was one of the, That's what I thought, but I just, yeah. That was one of the um, drivers, so to speak, of that okay. particular, that particular change, so. Okay. Thank you. I just, uh, I apologize, we're kind, of, we're kind of backing up because I just thought of one other uh, piece of information would be very valuable to know if you know it or the ATF, and maybe more likely the ATF, 
uh, and that is uh, <coughs> those uh, default proceeds that subsequently were deemed uh, to be to a prohibited person that they have to do a retrieve. Uh, how long did it take to get to the point where uh, ATF has been notified from the time of of the uh, start of that check on NICS to the time that it was determined? What, what would really be helpful is to know the average time or how much time it takes to determine that, in fact, this person should have been prohibited. I know in the GAO report it had that kind of information nationally, uh, but I'm wondering if we have any of that kind of data for Vermont. I will, I will add that to my query to yeah. the ATF to see. And um, maybe FBI knows that. They have. They, they, I will say the um, when I've chatted with either the FBI or ATF on this, they work very closely, obviously very closely together um, on that, um, given that this kind of a one hand in hand scenario um, on that. But I will absolutely reach out to them and see. The data that I received from the FBI didn't contain anything of that nature, but I'll check with the ATF and see if they have it or they can gather that for some, some area, for Vermont specifically. Again, there are some national statistics, but I'm wary of <coughs> generalizing if we don't have to. Thanks. Any additional questions or information I can provide? Thank you very much. I appreciate the committee. Did time. we give you enough work to fill your afternoon? Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor Davis from Gun Owners Vermont. Um, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this, so bear with me if I'm a little bit nervous and <laughs> stumble through my testimony a little bit. We'll try, um, we'll, yeah. say, yeah. we'll try to be nice. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, welcome and congratulations. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I, I thank appreciate you, you guys having me here. Um, uh, my testimony today is mostly going to focus on the uh, Charleston loophole part of the bill as uh, the rest of it was changed, um, obviously, very recently, and we haven't had a chance to really uh, you know, cover that thoroughly yet and, and give a, a good analysis. But um, I have my prepared testimony here, which I'd like to read to you guys, and I have uh, actually um, a copy of it for everybody and some resources and stuff that I that I use to uh, to get it. But um, here we are. Um, the Charleston loophole. To understand this obscure occurrence, one must first be familiar with the process of purchasing a firearm. When a purchase, when a person buys a firearm through an FFL. A background check is conducted through the National Instant Criminal Check, or NICS, system operated by the FBI. Under current Vermont law, all transfers of a firearm, including private sales, must be done in this fashion. Upon informing the dealer of their intent to purchase the firearm, the dealer will require the buyer to complete the ATF Form 4473, which I've enclosed a copy with my testimony so you guys can see what that looks like, and produce a valid picture identification. When the form is completed and signed, the dealer then initiates the background check through the NICS system, either electronically or by phone. The moment the call comes through on the FBI's end, the transaction is issued a unique identification number which stays with it throughout the process. Usually the instant background check is exactly that and will report back to the dealer within a few minutes one of three ways. Either proceed with the transaction, denied, which means the person has been found to be prohibited from owning firearms, or delay, which as we've heard means they need to do a little more homework on the buyer. Under the current federal law, the FBI has three full business days from that point before the default proceed status is reached. And it's important to notice that this default proceed order does not mean that the FFL must proceed with the transaction, rather they have the option to use their discretion in such cases. After the three-day window is up, and regardless if the transaction proceeds or not, the FBI will continue to gather information and try to make a determination on the buyer for up to 88 days or three months past the original attempt to of purchase until the federal law requires that the transaction be purged <coughs> from the next system. Actually, um, During this, wait, excuse me. So, um, up to 88 days. 88 days after the three-month window expires, so a total of three months that the FBI will investigate into this person before the law says that the, it has to be purged from the system and they move on to you know whatever else they're they're doing. 
Um, Thank you. Sorry. During this time, if the FBI determines the buyer to be a prohibited person, that triggers an order of operations in response to that information. And I've also attached a, uh, a flow chart of the sort of an action flow chart for the, the next system of to how they, they handle um, you know different things that come up. Um, the FBI will first call the FFL to determine if the transaction was completed. They also call the ATF to inform them of their findings. If the transaction was completed, the ATF will then take measures to retrieve the firearm from the prohibited individual. If the transaction did not proceed, the FBI will notify the ATF of the denial, at which point it will be the ATF's judgment whether to pursue the individual for attempting to illegally acquire a firearm. Using FBI data from 2017, approximately 31% of transactions turns up hits on the initial search which means that they inquired further investigation and didn't come back instantly. 20% of those were completed during the three-day window, while the other 11% were de delayed for additional research past three days. Ultimately, the FBI found that 1.2% of delayed transactions resulted in denial. This means that 98.8% of initial hits on the, on the NICS system resulting in further investigation were false positives and the purchaser was not a prohibited person. Furthermore, the FBI's own research shows that the NICS system allows a huge number of these delayed background checks to go uncompleted every year past the 90-day period. The FBI failed to complete approximately 1.3 million background checks from 2003 to 2013 and another 1.1 million from 2014 to 2019 respectively. Now, Remember this. A lot of this was before the fix next came through, and we don't have you know some up to date data if, if this has gotten better. But you know, still, it's uh, a, a big number. Um, prohibiting the transfer of a firearm while waiting on a large government agency to deliver a report could have profound implications for good people who seek to lawfully acquire a firearm, especially when compounded by such high rates of misidentification in the next system. Under this law, lawful citizens could well be denied their constitutional rights indefinitely and with limited mechanism of appeal. We believe that the implementation of such a provision in the current law will burden once again, the burden will once again fail, fall unfairly on the good people of Vermont. We also think that it's prudent to acknowledge an important piece of context and that the right to keep and bear arms is the only right which is both protected by the Constitution it also requires the pre-screening of any and all individuals attempting to exercise that right. We don't require background checks for peaceful assembly nor for petitioning our elected officials. We don't require a background check for an individual to be protected from unlawful search and seizure nor to have a timely trial by an impartial jury of their peers. We do not require background checks to guarantee that our people should not be subject to slavery and involuntary servitude as protected by the 13th Amendment nor is there any sort of vetting required for women to vote as protected by the 19th Amendment. We do not require pre-approval to speak one's mind openly through the press or by individual expression, and we certainly do not require it to practice the religion of our choosing. Religious zealotry is by far the leading cause of murder, oppression, and genocide over the history of mankind, yet the idea of a public safety measure requiring people to obtain the government's permission each time before attending church sounds downright ludicrous, as it should. Yet when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms, which is at its core the fundamental, the fundamental right of self-defense with which we are all born, and the right that preserves all the others, we have only for the last 26 years imposed this restriction, which most everyone now considers to be routine. Article 16 and the Second Amendment have become the, well, it depends, amendments. Regardless of one's personal opinions on the constitutionality of background checks for firearm sales, the fact remains that we do require them, and for the most part, the NICS system does a good job of screening prohibited persons. Sometimes they even do a little too well. As we previously indicated, research shows that the overwhelming majority of delays on the NICS system are false positives due to similar names and other assorted reasons. I get delayed buying a firearm quite often. My name is Eric Davis, and there's quite a few Eric Davises out there. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I lost my plate. When this happens, the best case scenario for the wrongfully identified purchaser is a delay in the sale and their ability to obtain a weapon for protection. The worst case scenario is an outright denial, which takes months of legal action and personal hardship to correct just to maintain one's rights. In this scenario, the question must be asked, 
if we are not only violating this person's right to self-defense, but also their right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law as guaranteed by the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. The point is that even without this proposed change in law, the system already errs heavily on the side of restricting people's rights on the chance that they might be a threat to public safety. As the committee heard from Henry Perrow last week, who's a local firearms dealer with over 30 years of experience, it's already an extremely rare occurrence that a firearm is sold to a prohibited person past the three-day waiting period, and in each case the ATF is immediately on the task of separating that individual from the firearm. The term Charleston loophole, which identifies this obscure corner of the law, is a misnomer created by gun control advocates for what might be best described as a microscopic pinhole in an otherwise broad and heavy canvas of a law. And it is disingenuous at best. When researching this specific phenomenon, we came up with some very interesting results. After many hours of searching for a statistic on how many crimes are committed annually with firearms that slip through this alleged loophole, we found clear documentation of exactly one, the Charleston shooting itself for which this is named. Now this is not to suggest that no crimes have otherwise been committed with a firearm obtained through a default proceed, but to recognize that the problem is so very minuscule that there is no observable data if in fact the problem even exists. It also bears noting that upon completion of the investigation into the Charleston shooting, the FBI determined that the drug possession charge on the shooter's record was a misdemeanor and not a felony, which means that at the time of purchase, the shooter was not a prohibited person under the criteria. While this information in no way lessens the abhorrence of the crime that was eventually committed, it does show that the NICS system worked as designed. This information also points to one very important conclusion, and that is that for all intents and purposes, the problem that this law proposes to address exists almost exclusively in theory. Given this information, Section 1 appears clearly to us as a solution in search of a problem, and if implemented, this policy will most certainly catch far more innocent people than criminals, and we strongly oppose this part of the bill. Did you, did you call yeah, me? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, you don't have to answer this, but just wondering, because you're the first person to come in here with sort of a personal anecdote. Sure. So if you wouldn't mind sharing what it's, what the experience has been like when your name comes up on the list and you're trying to purchase a fire, what is the process that you have to do to... Well, sir, um, I, absolutely. Um, I remember the first time it happened was actually up at the Powderhorn in Williston, and I, I was attempting to buy a pistol. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a gun guy. I buy and sell guns. I collect old military stuff, you know, so it's a, it's a fairly regular occurrence for me to be in a gun shop. And I, uh, I filled out the paperwork like I always do and was waiting. And usually the check comes back, like I said, almost instantly. And the guy comes up and he says, uh, I'm sorry, you've been delayed. And I said, what do you, what do you mean delayed? And he said, well, they, you know, they're not sure. they gotta, they got to do some homework. You have to come back in three business days. And I said, okay, well, you know, come back Saturday. And he said, well, no, three business days, so it's actually <laughs> into next week. And I was kind of taken aback, like, well, what do you mean I have to wait? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a criminal. I'm not a felon. I, you know, I don't have any bad stuff on my record. And he said, well, they, they're just not sure about you. So I left the gun shop feeling, you know, rather dejected, like kind of like my rights have been violated, you know, what the heck. Um, but, I mean, that's the way the system works. Like I said, they err heavily on the side of caution in such instances. And, uh, you know, after two days it came back and I went back and, and picked up the... So you didn't have to proactively do anything to clear your... Uh, I, I did not, no. It, it, it came back and it's happened uh, since then. It usually takes about two days for it to come back, but uh, I have heard of, you know, numerous people where it does not come back. And in that instance, like you heard from Henry Perro, um, you know, the FFL has the discretion that if you know, and they we're not too sure about this guy, they'll say, nah, they're, they're still checking up on you. So yep. there, there are safeguards in place already. In your testimony, uh, you used, uh, uh, when talking about the referral to the ATF, you mm -hmm. said something like immediately on the, the, it's immediately referred, they're immediately on the job of, of, of um, Use the word immediately mm. something. I'm just kind of curious uh, you, of what that, um, what the, the 
is of sort of how that looks when it, it is the referral instantaneous? Do, do, does the firearm get covered in an extended period of time? Do you know any of that information from your research? Um, I, I have, I gained most of that from listening to Henry's testimony last week and, and his experiences that he, I believe he said usually within 24 hours they're on the job of that, but I, I don't know um, specifically if there's an average time or anything like that. I'd be happy to reach out to ATF to, to find out. If I just didn't know if you, because you, I just didn't know if you had any any data in there. I you do, had a lot of. I do not have any specific data okay. on the time that it takes them to retrieve the fire. Okay. Thank you very much. Just a, a quick question. Uh, you had a number of statistics. Mm -hmm. Do you have a uh, citation or the documents from which you got? Uh, I do. I actually okay. have there. There are to my testimony where okay, I write my numbers. Excellent. And, and thank yeah. you for your testimony. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Anybody else? You did great. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So here, here's all the copies of my uh, testimony references and one for Mike. If he, yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, oh, yeah. Chief Superior Judge, uh, offering testimony on H610. The draft I have in front of me is 4.1. I did uh, receive it. Uh, late yesterday. Uh, I have circulated it to the judges and I would appreciate the opportunity to perhaps uh, come back after I've heard from more uh, judges than, than myself. Um, uh, with that in mind, I would just go to, well, I'll say, I'm assuming the committee has my testimony in mind from last week, so I'll just go to the new, new sections. So the first one I come to, and the way the bill is set up, understandably, uh, it talks about relief from abuse hearing, but it talks about it first as a final hearing as opposed to an emergency. Uh, the language that I'm concerned about is reflected both in both sections. Um, it's section 3A, beginning on line 60, on page 4, that relates to the, the uh, final hearing. <coughs> and with respect to the emergency hearing, uh, page 7, uh, beginning on line 12 through 18, the new language is found on line 16. I'd like to focus in on the emergency uh, proceeding first because that's, um, I'm looking at this as the way I would, it would be presented to me and obviously the emergency request comes first. And if I understand, uh, in part, the rationale behind both these provisions, uh, as we talked last week, the idea was, should it be mandatory that every temporary order and final order have the requirement of relinquishment and non-possession? And you recall my concerns about that from last week. With the new language, I don't think it changes anything, and I'll explain why. First of all, the emergency process comes about by the individual contacting, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll call it a hotline, an emergency line, and then they're referred to a uh, court personnel. That court personnel could be a staff person, um, or it could be someone contracted by the court. Um, consistent with what I've testified to before, that's because we have fewer and fewer and fewer staff people willing to do this on a voluntary basis. We are now down to, I'm going to say, four counties where staff are still willing to do this. So when we've contracted out with folks, uh, some of those folks uh, are actually covering more than one county, and for the most part, they're covering it by telephone. So the person is talking with a court employee, if you will, or contract, via the phone, getting this information. <coughs> so I have always approached relief from abuse proceedings. They are a civil proceeding uh, as opposed to criminal process. The big difference for me uh, sitting 
of these cases is that that means that it's the individual who brings the claim, the plaintiff, who decides what they're looking for, what relief they want, and how long the order ultimately will remain in effect. They control that. This provision, and again I'm looking at page 7 of the emergency hearing, there is no opportunity for me to gather any information at call it 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, other than what the staff person tells me. In other words, the individual contacts the staff person, tells them the type of order they're looking for, the staff person calls me, gives me a summary, uh, or reads the affidavit of the facts, and I either issue an order or I don't, and I decide what conditions would be imposed. This provides that unless the court makes written findings by clear and convincing evidence, that relinquishment is not required to protect the safety of the victim or the public. So, first of all, there's no opportunity for me to explore with the individual or take any testimony. Um, and I need testimony and facts in order to make findings. Uh, findings by the court are based on the evidence that's been presented. More to the point with, with this requirement is if there is no evidence presented by the plaintiff that suggests that firearms were either part of the incident that brings them to court after hours or there's some history of firearms, if there's no evidence of firearms, there's nothing for me, no basis, no factual basis for me to order a relinquishment, and there's clearly no evidence by which I could find, by clear and convincing evidence, that it's not required to protect the safety of the victim. If the information, if the evidence has not been brought to us, there's no basis for me to make such a finding, I wouldn't have the opportunity or the ability to make written findings. That's not the way the process works. Um, If, if the individual, um, and, I, and I know from the prior testimony that, and there's a, an amendment in the bill, <coughs> talks about the plaintiff did not want to be required to provide information about firearms. Um, they wanted to be given the opportunity if they so, um, <coughs> so desired. I forgot what page that's on, but it's a change from, if you look at page 6, um, beginning on line 15 through 20, the change there is the <coughs> plaintiff may, it says, permit, permit the plaintiff to provide that information. And so, consistent with what I was saying earlier about the court, that this is a civil proceeding, that the plaintiff, individual bringing it, has to tell us what they want. And, uh, and the basis for it. If they want an order, if they feel an order of relinquishment is necessary, they have to provide us the evidence. Um, and, and the committee may want to consider if that evidence is presented, that under those circumstances, the court uh, shall order relinquishment if there's evidence of firearms before the court. I'm not taking a position one way or another, but that's that's what I think this is driving at. Um, in other words, you're asking the court to make a decision based on a lack of evidence, as opposed to saying to the individual, this is your case. You decide what you want. Um, and if there's evidence of, of firearms being involved in the incident, or history involving firearms, or whatever the concern is, if it's expressed, that would provide us a factual basis to say relinquishment, non-possession. Uh, but we need that evidence to do that. Uh, I think it's also consistent with what I was saying last week about there are many types of, of uh, restraining order requests that come before us, and not every single one uh, requires relinquishment of firearms. Some of them aren't even a, a, a no-contact order. They're, they're a, a no-abuse or harassment order. 
So I would ask the, the, the committee to consider that. First of all, we, we don't make findings, uh, written findings, certainly in, in a late night call. We don't have the ability to do it. Um, we don't. We don't have any evidence before us other than what the plaintiff provides by way of affidavit. So your, um, so your concerns are the after hours. Yes, that's okay. why I'm focusing on that, and I'll go back to the final. But I, okay. because that's where the process starts, yep. okay. I, I want the committee to understand I'm looking at this as it moves through the court. So we would have, I mean, findings by clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is a higher standard of proof than granting the order for relief from abuse. Um, and we can't do it in a vacuum, and that's that's the way I'm viewing this clause. The other thing that I, I found interesting was that it says not required to protect the safety of the victim or the public. Um, th these orders are designed for the protection of the individual bringing the action, as opposed to, for instance, an ERCO order, which the, the criteria for an ERCO order is this person represent a danger to themselves or others, and it's a somewhat broader category. And if you look at page 13, just by way of contrast, um, at the top of page 13, this is talking about the search warrant assuming that it's been granted and the police are searching, a search and seizure of firearms is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of the victim. Um, and that's that, that would be appropriate. But I don't understand why, on the, the uh, emergency basis, we're looking at anything other than protecting the victim. Um, so I don't think I can say much more about that. Part of the same arguments, there would be a little different when we now go back to uh, beginning on page four, which is really the final order. So now, presumably, we've granted an order, uh, a temporary order, restraining order. Um, unless there's evidence before us, um, I don't think it's, you'll find a situation where the court will grant uh, the request for relinquishment if there's no evidence to support that. If there's two ways it could come in for final here. We could grant the temporary order and then it's set for final. Or if the evidence, we don't feel the evidence is there to warrant the granting of the order, we could deny the order. But every order that's denied, the person is informed that they have the right to request a final hearing. Mm -hmm. So it could still come in to us with or without a temporary order. And again, These are driven by the requests made by the individual. These are cases where, for the most part, they are self-represented litigants. Um, and the court is always trying to balance the need to get information to make the decision without being uh, an advocate for one side or the other, or even being perceived as an advocate for one side or another. And I have been in enough situations where the perception is sometimes greater than, than the reality. And by that I mean, I, I, and I've seen examples, someone feeling the court is favoring one side because they ask more questions on one side than they do the other. Uh, so the, the, it's the perception oftentimes of how the court is proceeding uh, that can make a difference. What I'm getting at is, again, this is fact-driven. There isn't a committee that sits in, in this building that doesn't talk about uh, evidence-based decision-making in, in terms of what the legislature does and what we do day in and day out. It's up to the plaintiff to tell us what they want relief they're looking for and what they feel they need to be safe. And so you're going to find that many judges, and, and believe me, not only myself, but the judges as a group, as a whole, understand the, the risks and danger uh, attendant to domestic violence, 
and the potential uh, for violence that's increased, enhanced by the presence or existence of firearms. So it's not a question of the, of the court not understanding the seriousness and, and the, the complexity of domestic violence, but we still ultimately have to make our decisions based on the evidence that's presented to us. So you're going to find that unless the plaintiff <coughs> comes forward with the evidence to support a request for relinquishment, uh, judges will uh, take the view, many of them, that it is not their role to create issues that aren't created, uh, raised by the parties. And so, again, I think you will find, and I, I obviously can't guarantee anything, but it has been my experience that uh, when the presence of firearms are before the court, whether it's in uh, a relief from abuse proceeding or in a criminal proceeding where the allegation is uh, domestic assault, uh, the court will act on that information and uh, prohibit the possession of firearms. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it, it's driven by the evidence. We talked last week about the conditions of release. Um, that even though there's a part of this bill that asks that language about firearms to be made part of the statute, uh, what I said last week and what I've said before when that issue comes before the committees, we do that as a matter of course. It's already built into the conditions of release and, and the chair asked if I would check with the other counties. Um, I haven't had a chance to hear from every county, but the website where the courts go to get the order for conditions of release has a standard condition, 13, that you must not buy, have, or use any firearms or dangerous or deadly weapons. These are the conditions that are imposed when someone comes in on a criminal charge of domestic assault. <coughs> and in my experience, it is almost a matter of routine for that box to be checked. Whether or not <coughs> firearms are, are part of that particular incident because of the recognition of the risk it presents. But when you're at it, that is a criminal uh, offense. The state is involved, um, and the state will often ask for that condition. Um, but in a civil proceeding, again, it's the individual who's making the decision or asking us to make a decision, and we can only do that based on the evidence. Um, so with respect to the final hearing, again, I think it depends on what is presented to us. If the plaintiff does not uh, indicate that guns are an issue, um, it is entirely possible that, um, that the court will not inquire further. Having said that, a final order, uh, if it's issued, has repercussions beyond, and you're going to find that in some instances, the court will order relinquishment uh, with or without that evidence. But in other instances, the judge will not. But they know that a federal court order will prohibit possession. Um, so I'm concerned that this sets up again the standard of, uh, by clear and convincing evidence, uh, again, we need having in mind that the plaintiff controls the evidence. If they have not brought out the evidence of guns, this would almost require us then to ask the plaintiff questions that they may not want asked. And that's why they didn't bring it to our attention. So we're caught um, in, in every situation deciding it hasn't been brought out. Even if I'm curious, I have to make the decision in a given case. Is the plaintiff not asking because out of fear that they will be the, the source of the court's order? Or that it's not an issue? And that's, that's the, the balance we have to address in, in, in every one of these situations. This would force us to perhaps, in the final hearing, um, if it's left in that way, to ask questions that the plaintiff may not want to ask. Um, one of the representatives asked the question about how many orders are issued and then they're dropped. That's not our decision to make. And when that person says they want to drop the order, uh, normally, at least in, in my case, and I think it's true of most judges, there will be a dialogue about the options that are available to someone. 
going from a no contact to uh, a limited order of no abuse or harassment. They can live together. But, um, it, but ultimately, it's the person making that decision. So <clears throat> I, I think that's why it's important to honor uh, their decision at that point and to honor their request up front of what they want. And if they don't create the evidence, bring the evidence to us, I don't think it's our position to make that evidence or otherwise try to create it. So, um, Excuse me, Martin. So I just want to back up to what you were saying on, on the final order. So if the issuance of the final order means that <coughs> under federal law the individual is not allowed to possess firearms, that's... Um, could the court then, I mean, because that, once that order is issued, the person's not supposed to have the firearms, right. I don't understand why the court couldn't issue a relinquishment order there. Right. I mean, yeah, and, and or, or shouldn't just automatically because it's under federal law, they're not supposed to have the firearms. I guess another question though is, is it legitimate in that instance? Well, no, I, you know. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. What I was saying was that a final order it is different, and there may be some uh, judges, given the facts before them and the history that's presented to them, will order in addition to knowing that the federal is a federal probation may in fact order relinquishment of any firearms. Um, right, which could start presumably the process of law enforcement investigating to see if in fact there are firearms present. That's one option, or whether well, it's legitimate in that situation for the court to ask about the presence of firearms because they are, would be deemed illegal once the order is issued. Right, but keep in mind that if, if, if the evidence isn't before us, we're just ordering relinquishment. Um, I can't speak for the police, uh, law enforcement, I wouldn't attempt to, but the, the essence of any warrant is uh, what specific evidence is there and where is it located right and that's so what I'm, I'm saying just an order of relinquishment I don't think is going to uh, assist the the police in searching unless they know unless there's more evidence and we may not have that so right I'm, right so there's two components here I'm asking is, is one if is it legitimate for the court in that instance in your view uh, because once that order is issued possession of firearms is illegal under federal law, is it legitimate for the court to ask any questions about that if the plaintiff hasn't brought it up? <coughs> it's it's probably in, it's in the court's discretion to do that. But right. I'm saying I don't know that every judge would do that under those circumstances, but they may in fact order relinquishment without making that inquiry because there is what if we what if we put in law that the court should in the final order I'm talking about make that inquiry to start getting that information. Then I'm going back to what I was saying earlier. That right. if, if the plaintiff isn't presenting that evidence, are they, present, are they not doing it because it's not a concern for them or they're out of fear? And by my asking those questions, am I then putting that individual at greater risk? That's always the, the issue before us. So the next step, though, is all right, you issue the order. It has relinquishment in there, whether or not you heard from the plaintiff, because it's tied to the fact that it's against law federally. Uh, that presumably goes to the law enforcement for service. And there, I mean, it's separate from what the court is doing mm -hmm. at this point. What, what we do as far as we, if there's any requirement for law enforcement to actually investigate to determine if there are firearms that need to be <coughs> So if, and again, every case is different, but let's assume there's an order issued that the court has not made the inquiry, there's been no evidence, but they order relinquishment because they understand or they know that there's going to be a federal prohibition. And that order includes relinquishment. And they go to serve the order. Um, <coughs> and then they, well, two things can happen. They can certainly talk with the individual separate and apart, with the plaintiff separate and apart from what happens in court about any knowledge they may have about firearms, uh, not only what firearms, but where. 
so that when the uh, officer goes to serve the order, uh, they can have that inquiry with the defendant. Now, the defendant may admit or, or may not. I mean, you rely on self-report at that time. But once the order is issued, the police may be able to develop a, a basis for them coming back to the court for a search warrant. So going back to the, the order from the court and relinquishment, it would seem to me, and you can comment on this, that, that requiring the court to always put in a relinquishment component in such an order is also of service to that defendant because you're essentially letting the defendant know if they don't otherwise know that now their possession of firearms is in, in fact against the law. I, I can't tell you whether the defendant would see that as a service or not. Well, <laughs> admittedly, but I mean, it's a transparency. It, it is providing that information which might not otherwise be known. I, I, I can't. Can't speculate on that? I wouldn't speculate. It was a, I could, but I don't, <laughs> wouldn't want to speculate. Um, but I think that's a different way that the relinquishment can be ordered even without the evidence. Um, it's different, uh, but it's the there, and then it's up to, again, uh, the, the law enforcement and the, the plaintiff, who would be that in any instance of any real um, <coughs> basis for securing firearms or searching for firearms, the plaintiff is going to have to be, I don't want to say have to be, it would probably be the primary source of that information. But that's why the police need to be involved in order to before they issue a warrant to be able to have the best information available to them. Matt? Right. And then um, we're going to have to wrap up, but... Oh, I've been oh. asking a ton of questions, so if someone else wanted, if someone else was on the line, then you wanted to... Anybody? Go for nope. it. So we'll, okay. um, we'll go through your question, and then we'll break, and then we'll come back after the... After the Judge, um, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying about the awkward place that this could be putting the court in um, for you, but at the same time, I'm trying to figure out how, um, you know, we talk, we've talked about how um, the, the person who would be before you is probably in a pretty difficult situation, usually self-represented, so not necessarily getting information that he or she may need to to know what they what they can ask the court, possibly in sort of an intimidating thing where, you know, I'm sure you try not to be too intimidating, but, you know, it's still in front of the... The process is Yeah, the process is intimidating. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out how we, how we do sort of level the playing field so that a person coming in at any, at any point would know what their... Can you see a path? to making sure that anyone going through that process knows that they can bring up those issues if they are comfortable to make sure that, um, that, that the court can evaluate that in a way that's somewhat fair. It's, 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 it's. So let me go back for a minute to the first part of your question. That it's awkward for the court. It's not awkward. That's what we do every day. It is, is this balance, whether it's this type of proceeding or another, anytime. Uh, there are self-represented litigants. Uh, there's always a difficulty in the balance the court has to make in trying to get information and not being viewed as advocating one way or another. Yeah. So, and so it's not an awkwardness, it's just that's what we do and that's what we have to do. Um, but in, in this situation, I think that information has to come before the individual gets to court and how they get that information <clears throat> I'm not sure I have the path for it, but if there are venues out there. I mean, when someone finds themselves in a situation, certainly the advocates are out there. Um, they are able to reach out to them. Um, it's been a long time um, since I viewed the. Uh, there's a video that's. They have to appear in court and, and um, observe. Both sides have to observe the video of what the proceedings are like. I don't remember off the top of my head whether um, that video uh, even references firearms. I should know, but I, I just don't remember. Um, is that available online or something? I believe that it is. Um, I believe that it is. Um, because
because one of the things, certainly if it's not now, is we're going forward with our new case <coughs> management system, it would be accessible that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but it may, in fact, uh, be on the web page now. I'm just not sure. Uh, but that would be another, if it's not there, then maybe that's, uh, maybe it's time to update, um, you know, that video mm -hmm. uh, or that kind of information. <coughs> so I think the information has to come to them. I mean, we're not, we can't be there to educate during the course of that proceeding. Um, so it has to, they have to have that information beforehand and make the decision. Uh, actually trying to educate them in the course of that hearing would be overwhelming. That, that's the difficulty. And that's, you know, obviously these hearings are fraught with emotions. Um, and, and that... That can change from the time they requested the order till the time they appear with us, usually within a week, no more than 10 days. Um, and a lot of things can change. Sorry. So I, I'm not sure I answer your question, but I think that information has to come. It gave me a flavor, so yeah, thank you. You can't educate them during the course of the, of the hearing. So follow-up question. Is there some form that a plaintiff has to fill up for seeking an, an RFA? Oh, yes. There's a complaint uh, form. So it would, could it be on a complaint form, whether there are firearms? Uh, could that be a question that's on such a form? Is that there present is the same question. issues? There is a question. I just maybe I can put my hands on it. Um, Thank you. Uh, so this is the, actually the affidavit that the person would have to file. So when someone, when they make that call and they're connected with the court staff or the court personnel, there's a complaint, there's an affidavit, um, and that's the information which is, is uh, relayed to the court via telephone. And because of the reduced number of individual staff, people that actually have person-to-person -person contact, most of this is being done over the phone. So the, the court personnel is essentially a scrivener in filling in the blanks on this form and then taking the person's over. But the question on this affidavit, actually the first question, is to my knowledge the defendant is or is not in possession of a dangerous weapon. And if we could get that form just so we can have sure. a <coughs> Sure. Sure. No, I have two questions. Thanks. Um, so, thanks. I'm, I'm going to stop us here.